Welcome everyone. I'm Judine Preddy, and I'm the director for the Work Learn Institute at the University of Waterloo. We're very excited to have you join us today. Before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm presenting to you today from the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples, and I respectfully acknowledge their ancestors and elders past and present. Our main campus is situated on the Haldeman Track, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River. I also acknowledge that as we come together today while staying apart, we are gathering on other traditional lands across the country. I acknowledge the enduring presence and deep traditional knowledge, laws, and philosophies of the Indigenous people with whom we all share these lands today. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the speakers joining me today. We have Chaitanya Bhatt, Director of Innovation at Loblaw. Chai has over 11 years of retail experience and has held a variety of different leadership roles in technology over his career. He prides himself on leading highly motivated and productive teams and is currently overseeing the innovation consultancy practice at Loblaw. Welcome, Chai. We also have with us Rupa Vamalupali, computer engineering co-op student at the University of Waterloo. Rupa is currently in her third year of studies and looking forward to working on co-op as a business strategy analyst for DataRaction, a startup that's working to build virtual peer-to-peer -peer learning communities. Her co-op, classroom, and volunteering with Engineering Without Borders have motivated her to decide on starting her own company at graduation at the intersection of tech and social good. Rupa also is our most recent co-op student of the award of the year award winner from the Faculty of Engineering. Welcome, Rupa. So many of you may be quite familiar with the University of Waterloo. This slide just highlights some aspects of what makes our university and particularly our co-op programs unique. The Work Learn Institute at the University of Waterloo does work in these three areas, and we're proud to be the host of this Future Ready Workforce series. The first event we held was back in February on the topic of recruitment, and the focus for today's session is on engagement. As we dig into the topic for today's event, which is about how organizations can engage the next generation of talent, I thought it would be useful to highlight what we mean by engagement. For the purposes of the research that we've done in this area and how we're gonna be talking today about engagement, I'd like to highlight two distinct components. One is about building connections with others and the other is about participating in meaningful work. So here's what we're going to cover today. We're gonna to talk about onboarding talent for a remote work. We're gonna cover how to maximize engagement through meaningful work. And we're gonna talk about how to tap into Gen Z's capacity for innovation. Let's dive in. Beyond the application and the interview phase, one of the first ways that organizations engage with their talent is in their onboarding process. While there's been a lot written about onboarding techniques and many organizations have developed programs for onboarding talent, a lot has changed for organizations over the past year when many work moved to having fully remote workforces. So from a research perspective, we were interested in examining the types of strategies and tactics that organizations use to onboard talent in a remote setting. We conducted a study in the fall term with almost a thousand co-op students and asked them about the types of onboarding activities they experienced during their remote work term. There were four main areas that they reported. The first were welcome messages. These may have been an email or a letter or maybe a call from their manager or senior leaders within the organization, or it may have been a public announcement. Another area that they reported were onboarding activities that included scheduled meetings. The topics for those meetings included introductions, uh, goal setting, as well as training for specific tasks. Students were also often involved in introductory sessions. Sometimes those were company-wide orientation sessions or maybe scheduled with specific team members. 
HR or senior leaders. And lastly, students indicated a number of resources that were given to them to help them get started. Those included things like name and contact information lists, uh, introductory schedule or a plan for the first few weeks of work, and sometimes a co-op student manual or a website that they could consult for training information. One of the things that we were interested in looking at is how the strategies that were used varied by the size of the organization that the students were employed in. Here are some of the onboarding tactics that students reported experiencing in their remote work terms. The two that are listed at the top, for example, were quite common across different sizes of organizations. The one thing I would note about these numbers, however, is that there may be some opportunity for improvement with almost 20% of students not receiving a personalized welcome or one-on-one -on -one time with their manager in most cases. When we look at the specific onboarding activities by organizational size, we do notice some differences. For example, having an online orientation program, which was much more common in larger organizations. For those of you who are from a small company or startup, we have a breakout session following this presentation with a team who will talk to you about strategies that work for small companies and startups. There are often two main reasons that employers report for hiring co-op students. One is having access to a flexible workforce of talented students who can help them get work done in their organization. In this case, students' performance in the organization it would be a key measure of success. The second reason many organizations hire co-op students is to build their talent pipelines. That is to bring students in and through their time in the organization, assess whether the student would be a good fit after graduation. The student, of course, is also assessing whether this is an organization they can see themselves working in more permanently. So in those cases, organizations are hoping to build a sense of commitment with the top talent they hire through co-op or other forms of work integrated learning. So it would seem these two outcomes, performance and commitment, are important in assessing the success of the experience from an employer's perspective. So what does this have to do with onboarding? Well, previous research has demonstrated a connection between the socialization process that a newcomer undergoes in an organization and their performance and commitment that they have. But the question we had was how might the remote work environment affect that relationship? Our specific question was, will the remote onboarding process affect students' performance and will remote onboarding be connected to students' commitment to that organization? What I can share with you today is that in our study, we did find a significant relationship between the remote onboarding of students and their performance as well as a significant relationship between the remote onboarding they experienced and their commitment to the organization. So the takeaway here is that the time the organizations are spending investing in welcoming the student online and helping them understand the organization and their role within it is paying off in terms of students' performance and commitment. And now I would like to turn it over to Chai to tell us a little bit about how Loblaw has managed the remote onboarding process as a way of engaging talent. Over to you, Chai. Thanks so much, Jadine. Um, great insights on obviously, uh, you know, one of the most important uh, things that are uh, that are top of mind for a lot of organizations. And uh, you know, we were just as we were prepping for the session earlier, um, I heard that uh, some on the Hopin uh, platform that you guys are watching this on uh, were, were commenting that it's interesting and, and sort of you know, sad in a way that we need to now attend sessions to learn how to attract, uh, you know, sort of the next generation uh, makes me feel old. Um, and especially given, uh, you know, I'm being asked to sort of um, to talk about my reflections on that, that makes me feel even older. But, um, but you know, I, I wanted to just say that I'm, I feel very humbled uh, to be uh, talking to all of you. You know, I fully recognize that many of you, if not all of you, uh, could be on this side sharing your stories. Um, you know, I'll, I'll aim to share some tactics and, and, and some, you know, experiences as well, pepper in with, uh, you know, some perspectives to add to what Jadine has been talking about. So in, in talking about the onboarding process, I think the key thing about, um, you know, what, what has happened with the virtual, uh, virtual onboarding is, is sort of um, 
you know, if you think about, uh, you know, uh, COVID-19 and, 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 and all of that, one of the things that uh, the this pandemic has done is it's really um, brought out some of the underlying problems. Uh, you know, and when you think about the health conditions of people, right, underlying health conditions get exasperated by, by uh, you know, this, this, this virus. In a similar way, um, you know, poor practices and, and poor, um, uh, you know, ways in, in engaging with people just get amplified even more uh, when we are talking about, uh, you know, onboarding people and all of that as well. So it's sort of a, a little bit of that, uh, you know, sort of <clears throat> life imitating art in a sense. Um, I think that uh, the, the the key thing, key message I would say uh, is interactions over processes. Don't get bogged down with this is how we do things, but rather focus on the relationship that we want to build or that you individually want to build uh, with that particular co-op student and, and how we can help them develop as much as how they can be productive in our teams. I think three major things that come to mind, being purposeful, first of all, and I know that in a previous session uh, you would have attended, you know, about how to go about the recruitment process. But the key piece is around be purposeful about the role that you're hiring for and make sure that there's a fit, first of all, right? And and be open and honest about that. You know, one of the things I like to do is to actually call the student ahead of them starting, um, you know, while they're not inundated with all this information about the organization and the people and all of that stuff. They have a little bit more brain space to be able to absorb conversations, you know, talk to them about here are some of the, you know, things that you can expect in the first week, month, you know, and so on and so forth. One of the great things that um, Lobla does really well is we have an HR toolkit um, that the HR team has set up. A shout out to our HR BP and, and team. They've been great at actually helping us, uh, you know, organize us and, and train the managers actually well in advance of the students onboarding. So about a month in advance, um, there's a lot of information shared about how we should go about doing that. So a lot of the tactics I'm going to talk about are really the tactics I've learned uh, through those sessions. Um, the second piece, uh, you know, being purposeful was the first. The second is about prep and plan the onboarding. It's just like any other, uh, you know, project you might be working on. Planning is key. If we don't, uh, you know, um, succeed to uh, plan, we uh, we plan to fail, basically, right? Um, and so, uh, with with that, there are a few things that are important that that again, um, you know, kind of are highlighted. One is uh, the LT or sort of orientation, generally speaking. What we do here at Law of Law is we have two layers of orientation we actually do. One is to the overall business, the enterprise itself, and one is to, uh, in, in my case, the Law of Law Technology Organization, where the students actually get a good idea of what's actually happening. You know, what are we here uh, for? Um, and they're onboarded just like any other colleague. The co-op students are here, uh, you know, they're looking to uh, gain um, uh, experience, but also they're looking to contribute. So making sure that you treat them the same as, uh, while some caveats are there, same as any other colleague that might be joining. Uh, the other piece that has been very useful is having a buddy system, especially with new grads that have might have joined your organization. So in my team, for example, um, <clears throat> we've been very fortunate to actually have a few interns that have stayed on with us and, and become full time, um, and sort of one of our one of our first uh, interns that, that flipped over to full time. She's sort of not only helping with the overall LT intern experience, but also specifically within the team. So that really helps to kind of guide them um, and and you know help them really understand you know what they can get out of it, you know the the gotchas, all of those things. One of the things I also do um, ahead of sort of them joining and onboarding is um, I'll sit down with um, each of the students and, and map out a 30, 60, 90 day plan. Uh, you know, we're no strangers to, to those types of techniques, but, but it really helps people orient and, and, and helps with sort of the, the neurons connect in people's brain about, you know, what are the things that are going to be important and how can they get up and running very quickly. Um, and, and all this said, I think the big message underlying all of this is these interactions aren't about a one-time onboarding event, right? This is a journey that needs to happen throughout. And what I've learned through, uh, you know, mistakes that I've made is is making sure that we have regular check-ins with them. And part of that um, is actually having a community of practice almost with the interns. One of the things that our HR team does is they have a pulse check on a monthly basis to actually bring together the uh, interns so that they can talk openly about what's happening. 
one of the good things that that actually happens there as well is the managers also get together and say, hey, um, you know, I think my students may have a few more cycles available because I thought that I might be busier than I am. And so some of my students can take on side projects that others may have. So we've we've done that as an example where we've given side projects in the innovation team to other interns. And, you know, not only have we elevated their experience, uh, but being able to have them be more productive as well. And so these are some of the things that tactics that um, I think have helped uh, some of the students and some of the interns that have joined us uh, here. I think, um, you know, as I think about the experience on the on the other side, it's great the way that we're setting up this conversation to have someone like Rupa to talk about what her experience actually has been and, and what are some of the things that have worked. So Rupa, over to you to, uh, to reflect on some of your experiences. Thanks, Chai. Um, you mentioned a lot of very insightful points there, and I will touch on them briefly. Um, and but before getting to my response, um, I just want to reintroduce myself. So I'm Rupa, third year computer engineering student and uh, making my way into my fourth co-op term, uh, actually next week. Um, and so today I'm here to bring some of my perspectives as a co-op student and hopefully drive home some of the awesome points that both Judine and Chai are talking about. Um, so now about virtual onboarding and how it compares to in-person. Um, first thing is, it's a mix of a lot of the same onboarding principles as in person, but now shifting to remote and being very intentional in the value added, which is the performance and or commitment metric that Judine mentioned. So one big thing is whether in person or virtual, many co-op students benefit greatly from learning about the company, getting a sense of work environment and building workplace relationships. One way I've enjoyed this during my past co-op terms was having virtual team socials through games night or coffee chats, or even having a guest speaker leading an open discussion about a new topic. These are all strategies that I've personally seen have worked really well in the workplace, and they've done really well in increasing co-op engagement and boosting employee morale, especially early on. Um, also touching on the buddy system that Chai has mentioned, I have seen that work very well in my co-op terms as well, especially um, when I was struggling um, in the beginning with some new concepts. So for the first few weeks, this strategy ensured accountability and a faster learning curve. And one final thing I'd like um, to tell employers is to just be aware of longer and more patient onboarding processes. Um, as we all have talked about, um, we're gonna need to do more onboarding activities and change company culture and adjust the way we do, um, we do work. Uh, especially remotely. So some co-ops might find this very hard and quite overwhelming um, as I have in the past. So I would urge you to be patient and account for the added delays and challenges in order to ensure a more healthy and positive work environment for your co-ops. Great. Thank you, Chai and Rupa. Those were uh, some great insights. I love the idea of the community of practice. And um, I agree with you that in remote onboarding, that that connection to a mentor or peer that you can that you can reach out to to ask for help is is critical. Um, so the next topic we're going to talk about today is how organizations can maximize engagement through meaningful work. So I'm going to oversimplify the situation for a moment. But when we think about both the employer and the student perspective on the work term, there's a potential for tension. So that is from the student perspective, they want to contribute to the organization while they're there, but they also want to learn new things. That is, they don't want to only be given work that they see as straightforward or easy. From the employer's perspective, though, they may have new students coming in every four months and if they give the students work that's not straightforward, it means they need to spend time training and supporting each new student in learning how to do the work, which one could think of as a cost to organizational productivity. So it was this tension that was the focus of research that we've done. That is, how do the tasks given to students create a win-win such that both the organization and the student benefit? So, while I'm not going to go into great depth on this research, I'm going to share with you some key insights. So the question was, how can we resolve the potential tension between the goals of the employer and the goals of the student? And one possible answer is to vary the importance and the challenge of the tasks given to the students, 
or as labeled on this slide, vary the criticality and the complexity of the tasks. So if you think about the potential tasks given to students, some of that work may be critical to the operation of the team or unit. Maybe there are daily or weekly reports that if the student wasn't there to produce them, someone else on the team would need to do it. In that case, those tasks have a high level of criticality. Because of the high level of criticality, it might be advisable to keep the complexity of those tasks relatively low with respect to the student's capability so that the overhead for training the student and the risk to the organization and having the student do it is relatively low. So one set of tasks given to students may be low in complexity and higher in criticality. Even with a lower complexity, these tasks are meaningful to students because they can see the importance of them or the connection between them completing them and the goals of the team or the department. To counterbalance those tasks, another set of tasks or projects given to students may be less critical in terms of timing. These may be things that you need someone to investigate, projects that have been on wish lists for a while. What this means is that the criticality of the tasks is lower, which then allows for the complexity or the challenge for the students in the projects to be higher. It can be something that students have more autonomy or flexibility in completing, which in turn increases the meaningfulness of the tasks for students. Combining tasks where there are some from each of those two types will create a role where students have the opportunity to contribute productively, as well as continuing to develop their skills. The other thing that I wanted to share with you today is that we monitor indicators of students' work term experiences, and we were interested in how those indicators indicators might be affected by remote work. We examined the differences between students' responses from 2019 when they were working in person in organizations as compared to ratings when most students were working remotely in 2020. In the case of students' reports of their opportunity to make a meaningful contribution, the students provided slightly higher ratings during their remote work terms. In the case of opportunities to learn, students' ratings were relatively consistent between in-person and remote work. Where we saw lower ratings for the remote setting was in students' reports of their opportunity to build professional network. While probably not surprising result, it is one to think about as organizations consider having more of their workforce working remotely. While there's a component of this that is obviously the individual's responsibility to take initiative and to reach out to make connections within the organization, there's also an opportunity for organizations to support their early career talent by assigning mentors, as was mentioned earlier, or creating a culture where there's an opportunity for pe meeting people in the organization that aren't necessarily in your immediate team. And Rupa gave some great examples of that. And so now I'd like to turn it over to Chai to talk about how Labla thinks about meaningful work. Great, thanks. Jadine, before I go into the tactics and some of the tools that we use, I just wanted to reflect on the last comment that you made around, uh, around making sure that um, you know, students have the ability to connect in a meaningful way as well. And one of the things uh, that, that I just actually got yesterday um, yesterday, I just uh, saw a note come through about recognizing one of the interns on our team and, and a few others as well, uh, talking about how they how great they were in, in being able to drive um, some of the work that uh, had been done with the women in technology group that we have within Loblaw. And um, these these couple of uh, interns actually have have really driven up the quality of the sessions that are being held at uh, at these uh, uh, you know within these uh, women in technology you know group meetings and things like that. And uh, you know in reflecting about that, one of the one of the key reasons why it was so great was sort of this unique perspective that the 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 youth the the younger generation are really driving. And I know we're going to talk about it a little bit later on. But I think part of it has to do with being allowing the student to be rooted in meaning in a meaningful work such that they can explore other things that can allow them to be to feel even more engaged and even more productive. And I think there's this cycle in this in this give and take. You know, you talked about the tension. I almost see it as uh, something that works well together. Um, you know, one helps the other. As you have the student starting to understand and, and make more progress with meaningful work. 
it allows them to then say, I have a little bit more space, brain space, a little bit more ability to do the sometimes the grunt work. And I do want to acknowledge that, you know, there's the grunt work and the great work, right? And and all of us have to deal with that. Um, you know, there is this uh, there is this idea that you need to get some stuff done often. But um, wh what does it mean to all of us? All of us, we find meaning in work because, you know, we've been able to develop the career and we know we've had this sort of, um, you know, experience where we've picked up on what this meaning means for us, right? And so it's helping the students really explore and define this concept of meaning. And, and I, I would categorize into three things. One is ensuring that the student understands that their work matters. What they're doing is aligned to an overall vision and a mission for the organization. And drawing that line is very important. And if in drawing that line, you realize that there isn't one and that what the work that they're doing is really not connected, that's when you really have to self-reflect and say, are we uh, you know, leveraging the co-op or the student in the right way? Or to be very blunt, and I'll say something unpopular is, are they just cheap labor? If they're just cheap labor, this is not you know, probably the way to go. Um, and, and instead, you know, um, you should be looking at it from the perspective of how can we actually help them, uh, you know, develop further. The second piece around that then is helping them find value in the work that they're doing, uh, value for themselves. How are they growing individually? So one of the tools that we use is this concept of using OKRs or objectives and key results, making sure you're setting up what that meaning means right, or at, at the high level, and then allowing them um, leeway to be able to define those key results and define those actions that are going to help drive those key results. The other part of that um, uh, is this um, individual development and talking about it early on to say, what is it that you want to get out of, you know, this particular internship or this particular co-op placement, uh, what is it that you want out of it? And, and making sure that those things are aligned and spending time is key because the more time you spend on that piece of it, the more the productivity really comes out. And then at the end of the day, you know, we have to be real. Not everything is going to have that tie-in, but as I said earlier, making sure that we understand it is a bit of a debit credit system where there will be some grunt work that will need to get done and you will have to give it to, you know, students to, to, to get it done typically. Um, and when you do that, acknowledge that that is the case and acknowledge that there is other work that we are also going to engage in and that we're going to have the student engage in that will have more meaning both for themselves and for the organization. So I think I think these are some important uh, pieces that are really important. One of the good things that um, you know HR does really well is helps us connect across sort of the uh, Loblaw technology community and even outside to say, if there are opportunities that students are in, interested in outside of their particular niche or their particular role, um, there's a lot of opportunities to do side projects. And that really helps a lot. Like I just mentioned, the student that in, in, was involved in, in the women in technology, those things do matter and those things do come back and, and help a lot. And a little bit later in, in sort of the next section, I'll be talking a little bit about you know, how the, the, the mindset of Gen Z really kicks in um, you know, with the core of our work, which is innovation. But before we go there, one of the things um, that I, uh, you know, that, that I loved uh, when we were talking, Rupa, was, uh, you know, some of the perspective that you had about exploring this meaning within your placement. So I'd love for you to share some of uh, that insight. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Chai. I, uh, I personally really like your mention of helping students find meaning and value in work. Because I know when I I started off, I like working in uh, my first work term, I didn't really understand the idea of like, what does a valuable work experience really mean or look like? Because it was my first work term. So I wish I had that one to one chat with my employer and to just kind of understand like how they find meaning in their work and just understand even the richness of opportunity sometimes. So thanks for all those awesome points. So yeah, I will dig deeper into another area and talk a little bit about how work um, being a catalyst for one's long run goals and aspirations can actually create a more positive and meaningful experience right now. Um, turning to a personal story, um, at the beginning of my second co-op term at Rushby Energy, I recall my employer, Greg Rushby, and I having a con casual conversation about my goals and aspirations. And here I told him that I wanted to start my own business in the future and I struggled to find the right experience 
that helps me understand the moving parts. Although completely unrelated to my job description as an energy analyst, he immediately suggested accompanying him to client meetings and strategy discussions. And almost instantly, I felt my work experience completely transformed into something way beyond what I expected than a job description. My curiosity and interest from the, for the job eventually grew and led to my creation of a potentially revenue generating iOS app and representing the company at an annual Energy um, Solutions Expo, uh, which is a trade show that's hosted for top of the field energy experts. So all of this was work that, that led to my achievement of the Co-op Student of the Year Award. And it was all because of the fact that I was able to create this positive and meaningful experience out of my work term. Um, on the other hand, I also understand that not all projects are gonna be completely relevant to one's own future goals and aspirations. And here, I'd recommend a strategy that my future employer, Inferni Chan, CEO of Data Reaction, is doing right now, which is setting up a personal development goal and having bi-weekly meetings or weekly meetings to carve out and ultimately help the student achieve it. And to some extent, um, you know, maybe a, a, uh, achieve a part of it by the end of their work term. And for me, this makes for a really positive and meaningful work experience and really excites me about my upcoming work term. And so personally, I'd recommend employers to take the time to perform this exercise, have a quality conversation with your co-ops or employees and allow their interests and passion to fuel the quality of work and motivation at your workplaces. Wow, Rupa, um, what, a, what a great example of, of how one of those more informal conversations can really uh, turn the tide and, and turn into something so uh, empowering. So um, we're going to talk more. We're going to talk more about that as we move into this final section of the presentation where we're going to talk about tapping into the next generation's capacity for innovation. If you've tuned into previous online events that we've held, you may have heard us speak about the Future Ready Talent Framework. This is a research-backed tool that we've developed and recently launched. It's a framework that we will be using with students and employers as we talk with them about the skills that are gonna be needed for the future. And as students think about the ways in which they're developing these skills during their work experiences. We'll post a link in the chat if you're interested in reading more about it. The reason I share it with you today is to highlight that one of the 12 talents we've identified as important for future readiness is to have an innovation mindset. And so as we explore innovation and in the next generation of talent, I wanted to start by highlighting some research that synthesizes work done in the neuroscience and developmental psychology fields done by two Waterloo researchers and work learn associates, Ilona Doherty and Amelia Clark. They explored existing research related to emerging adults, those people who are characterized by their age range of 18 to 24. What they noticed about this age group is that because of a number of factors, including the state of brain development, they have emerging adults have many of the same traits that are common in successful entrepreneurs and innovators. You'll see a few of those traits listed here. At the emerging adult life stage, creative thinking is at its neurobiological peak. That is, as we age, we gain the benefits of knowledge and wisdom, but the originality needed for creativity is more present when we're young. Also, because of this stage of heightened brain capacity, emerging adults are typically quite observant and curious. They have an increased sensitivity to and awareness of their environment. And the third trait I'll highlight is that they like experimentation and questioning the status quo. For any of you with teenagers in your home, I happen to have three in mine, you can probably relate to that. The research shows that in general, openness to new experiences does peak in this emerging adulthood phase and then continues to decline with age. So I share this information with you today to know that as suggested by Doherty and Clark, that instead of seeing youth as in transition to adulthood, that this particular stage of emerging adulthood is potentially an untapped source of social and economic potential. So the question now is how can organizations tap into that innovation potential? And we have a few suggestions based on the research we've done. 
I'm going to return to the idea of role design here, and I'm going to pick up on some of the things that both Chai and Rupa have referenced into how their experiences with students in the workplace and su suggest some ideas that we've seen organizations that we've done research with do. The first idea for tapping into innovation is to provide students with a highlight project. It's something that they can uh, work on during their time in the organization and is seen as important to the organization, maybe something that the students share as a report or a presentation at the end of the term. It gives the student the opportunity to investigate, problem solve, and use their creativity. In examples where we've seen this, students have identified solutions that hadn't previously been considered and often can quantify the value to the organization of implementing their proposed solution. With respect to the daily or routine tasks, students can often identify incremental improvements to processes because they bring a fresh set of eyes and are curious about why things are done in a certain way, or they may have seen it done in a different way at a previous experience. One thing to note about this, however, is in the research that we've done with students, we've heard from them that they're often looking for signals or explicit comments from their employer to encourage them to make these type of suggestions. If they feel they're bothering coworkers or supervisors by making suggestions, they likely won't. So if you're open to hearing their ideas for ways that processes can be improved, please tell them. And lastly, side projects. This has been mentioned already today, but most, most teams have a list of projects that they would like to get to, but just haven't reached the top of someone's list. Consider which of those projects could be taken on by your students. While some students report being incredibly busy on their work terms, many others report that they have time when they're less busy because either they've gotten work done quicker than was expected, or they're waiting for to hear back from other team members. Side projects may not be as time sensitive, and so it may offer students the opportunity for experimentation. You may also want students to be observant and to propose ideas for side projects based on what they see happening in your organization. And now Chai, I'll turn it over to you to elaborate a little bit further on how Loblaw engages youth in innovation. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, this is um, a big passion of mine, so I could probably go on for hours and, and people will start dropping off shortly. <laughs> If I go on forever, but um, but I, it is a big big passion of our, ours. Um, not only the the you know the concept of innovation, obviously, and being the director of innovation consultancy here, um, but but also just um, how the sort of new generation is really changing uh, or can really change the trajectory of of a lot of businesses. There's a lot of information out there, and Jadine, you've you've shared a, a good swath of it, and and there's a ton of other things out there. But I wanted to just highlight. A couple of things that 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 uh, that are of note that kind of lead to the uh, unparalleled capacity, first of all, for for the these digital natives, as it were, um, to innovate. One of the biggest things, uh, trends that are happening in all workspace workplaces, really, is around this idea of multi generational um, folks within the workplace. There has been obviously through the pandemic, and even before that, through um, you know, recessions and other sort of financial issues that have occurred, um, say, in the past couple of decades, more and more people and as well health as well, uh, people are living more healthily, um, generally speaking, COVID aside. Um, and as a result, people are staying in work longer. What, my, what that means is you might have all the way from baby boomers all the way through to um, folks uh, that are in the Gen Z sort of space, uh, all working together. Um, and so and ensuring that we come from a place of empathy is very important. And this is one of the cornerstones, uh, cornerstones of innovation, obviously. You have to come from a place of empathy. You need to understand who the people are in, in front of you to be able to really um, understand that. So, if, you know, I'd like to flip that on onto, onto its head and say, how do we, uh, you know, develop that empathy for the Gen Z that are joining us uh, for these co-op terms? You know, first thing is these folks are true digital natives. They were born at the same time as Google was born, right? Um, 2008 was when Google was uh, incorporated and that was uh, the, the the time range in 1996, or sorry, 1998 was when it was 
uh, first incorporated, and um, uh, 1996 and 1998 is is the time frame uh, for the earliest generation of the Gen Z. Um, and so you can see that in 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 the chart that I have on the left side, which says you know Generation Z essentially outnumber all other folks in terms of uh, sort of uh, searches online, right? Uh, you know, the, the concept of I'll Google it, right, <laughs> is, is, is sort of very prevalent in that um, age demographic. The second piece is around resilience, counter to popular belief, uh, which has always been the case about talking about the next generation. Um, the next generation, Gen Z, are not, in fact, less resilient. Uh, they, in fact, have a different worldview. Um, and, and that's sort of coming from the place of, in 2008, seeing their parents and themselves having to go through the financial crisis, you know, having to go through this COVID crisis. All of these things have made them extremely resilient and looking at the opportunity, looking at how this can actually turn into uh, something opportunity, opportunistic for us in the future. How can we turn this, you know, these lemons and turn them into lemonades? And, and all of these are, are going to be exemplified in the one specific example that I'll give in a minute here. The last piece is around sort of the diversity, diversity in every which way, whether that be from an educational background and sort of this idea of having cross-functional uh, and, and cross-program pollination of, of having business and arts as an example. Uh, and a lot of these other programs that are being developed at, uh, you know, within universities are an example of that from an educational standpoint. Of course, diversity from people uh, and, and their background standpoint, it's huge uh, within the next generation. It's the most diverse generation in the history of the world. Um, uh, and so understanding that all of those factors are what is forming the worldview. And that actually is leading to some really great positive things as it relates to creativity, resilience, and open-mindedness of this generation. Um, the creativity comes from this ability to not have to, you know, focus on memorizing facts and remembering phone numbers, right? Who, who you know, th this generation doesn't need to do that. And so they, they can apply their brains, apply their, 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 their capacity in a more creative way. They're extremely resilient, like I talked about, and the open-mindedness is is exemplified through their, um, you know, focus on making sure that diversity is at the center of any place where they're going to go work. Um, and so those are those are some important factors that to keep in mind. And one example that I like to give with this one is is sort of an important, uh, you know, piece of work that needed to be done. One of our teams, the the optical team, um, had come to us and said, "Listen, we've done." optical the way it's always been done we need to rethink our, our business model a little, little bit without getting into the details you know they wanted to see how technology could be leveraged for the future of uh, of that and we actually gave this task to one of our students um and so they uh, did the research uh, she did the research uh went through looked at not only what are the technologies out there but what are all of the uh, legislations in the various different provinces within canada and came up with a really robust plan that she then presented um to the executives with the guidance from some of the folks on our, on the team uh, she was able to present to the executives and that became uh, one of the cornerstones of uh, how we're looking at optical in the future and now we're actually or we have earlier this year piloted a remote optometry at a few locations uh, out in British Columbia so you can see how impact can really be made if we channel this creativity resilience and open-mindedness and in talking to Rupa you know she's a perfect example of someone like that so I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how you were able to drive that for your employer as well of course. Thanks, Chai. That what an awesome example highlighting, you know, the kind of three pillars that you mentioned around creativity, resilience, and open mindedness. I think that's that's awesome. And I've seen a lot of co-op students just through my experience and a lot of my friends who've done um, very remarkable achievements. So that's amazing to hear. And so my response to this question will be obviously based on my limited three terms of co-op experience, but I think I will definitely share my insight and. Basically, what I think um, is the key to developing an innovative mindset is tapping into one's own creative potential and sense of self. And this will look different for different people, but I think academic and work term experiences are a great way to develop that mindset and it'll offer a diverse amount of experiences to help you do that. So first of all, speaking about academic terms, um, these are one of the most challenging times for students and they feel very chaotic and they're very stressful. 
and they're often super challenging at times. Um, but during these challenging times, it often sheds light onto questions like, why are we pursuing our degrees? Why not quit? And I'm sure as students, um, all of you might have felt the same way. And as Chai has mentioned, these are things that are not obvious. And we and um, a lot of students and people, we want to get closer to meaning and a sense of self through our work. Um, from personal experiences, however, these moments were very important. And for me, it revealed that being an engineer is about helping the people around me, the underprivileged and, un and the under-resourced. And this is how I felt most satisfied from the work that I was doing. And using these skills to give back to my community was pivotal. And so this is how I co-founded the Engineers Without Borders design team at the University of Waterloo, which is the first team in all of Canada to have a team of students working, to, uh, working on design problems in partnership with tech startups in East Africa. In building this team, I found more meaning in my engineering degree and felt um, myself thinking innovatively beyond ever before. And because of that now, I've, I feel like I've tapped into my core values and self sense of identification as an engineer. And so in a lot of similar ways, work experiences are also wonderful opportunities in offering diverse and sometimes challenging experiences that help students learn more about themselves. For, for example, their strengths, weaknesses, gaps, style of work, leadership. Um, these are all things that you get, you get to learn through co-op. And, get get, and in learning that and getting closer to that, students start to form the lens and framework for which they can innovate and think creatively. And for myself and a lot of co-op students, that's really what co-op's all about. A safe space for experimentation um, providing uh, provided opportunities and lots of rich and deep learning and reflection. And so as Chai and Judine have mentioned, like creating that, that space to contribute, innovate and reflect as students are journeying through their work experiences is super important to help shape both our performance and those commitment metrics that were mentioned as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Chai and Rupa. Um, Rupa, I love the connection between um, the reflection, the the better sense of self, and then how that le how that you see that connected to the innovation mindset. Really, really inspiring. So as we wrap up and move into questions and answers, I just want to leave you with a few key takeaways. So based on our research, I can share that three key ways that organizations can improve workplace engagement with the next generation of talent are to help them build and maintain strong relationships enable them to make meaningful contributions through their work and provide them with opportunities to innovate, whether those be big or small. A topic that we haven't had a chance to dig into in this presentation that is also important for engaging the next gen generation of talent is feedback and evaluation. We're fortunate to have a great team from our Work Integrated Learning Programs Department to share with you tips and insights on the importance of feedback in their breakout session that's going to follow this presentation. More details on that in a couple minutes. As well, I mentioned earlier that we also have a great team lined up to share tips for small businesses and startups. And now I would like to thank Chai and Rupa so much for sharing their time and their insights with us today. Here's some information for staying connected with us. We will be sharing these slides with those who registered for today's session. So if you, so you'll have information with you about how to connect with us. A couple of things to highlight. We do offer a newsletter that contains information about latest research and information about upcoming events. You can sign up for that by visiting our website. There will also be an option to sign up in the post event message you receive. And a second note to highlight is that the next event in this series will be about converting and retaining the next generation of talent, and it will be held on July 14th at the same time, noon Eastern. As I mentioned, there will be two breakout sessions. Oh, we're gonna start with questions and answers. So I'm gonna start off, Chai, if you don't mind. Um, could you share some examples of the meaningful work and projects young talent or co-op students so you've talked about one or two maybe you could share another one with us yeah i mean honestly there is no end to what uh, students can achieve at Lavla, to be honest uh, and and i truly believe that I, I wouldn't say it if i didn't i've worked for Lavla for 11 years um you know so obviously i'm loyal to it but you know i think even reflecting on my experiences i think it's a very open and um you know um, sort of 
great working environment where you can get involved with a lot of different things. I think it really, the the cap on what you can do is just say your skill sets or your your drive really, not even your skill sets, because you can always pick those up, but really the drive that you may have. So, um, but, but I would say that, uh, you know, some of the things that we have our students do is sort of, you know, help drive experience and, um, you know, engagement uh, with, um, within the intern uh, interns themselves and so we like to take at least one person from the incoming income co intern cohort and be part of that experience and driving the experience so that again they're the what we call in retail voice of the customer similarly voice of the intern is kind of a part of the program uh, the other piece is also uh, being involved in key projects that we might be working on um, in, in some way, shape, or form. And so what we like to do is it could be the research aspect of it. It could be a little bit of, you know, developing prototypes. It really depends on the skill sets um, for the various different students. But but yeah, there's there's no end to what you can get involved in. Great, thanks. I, I think that tip of, um, of having current students help you um, set the path for, for next students is a, is a great strategy that, that organizations use. Um, I'm wondering, um, Chai, maybe you can answer this as well. In what ways are you seeing co-ops benefiting from remote work compared to in-person? And then Rupa, I'll, I'll ask you that same question. Great. Yeah, I was just going to say uh, it would be it'd be great to get Rupa's perspective on it too. I'll, I'll make it quick. I think, you know, for 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 us, I think I think that remote work has its challenges. I think it has its benefits. I think from a benefit perspective, a lot of times it opens up opportunities for students that may not have had uh, the ability because they're landlocked or, or or they're you know situated in a particular location and so they're not able to move around as freely um, especially when they might be tied to say a residence uh, you know within uh, within the university that they might be locked into things like that so there's there's those aspects the logistical aspects of you know working anywhere other than where you live um, and then there's also living with your parents and all those dynamics uh, you know it gets expensive and uh, you know co-op terms uh, you know uh, may not justify you moving to another location so that part of it is there but i think the other part of it is uh, probably the remote work allows you to um, actually connect with a variety of different people um, if you uh, set it up that way if, you, if you're engaging and if you can do that and then the last piece i would say is um, you know, as Gen Z, as we said, they're digital natives, right? And so they have a bit of a leg up in terms of being able to use the teams and this and that, and you know, being able to pick it up very quickly. Um, you know, my 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 uh, nephews and, and nieces and things like that, they're they're able to pick this up like this. And while 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 being older, I struggle. Um, but uh, but yeah, so th those are some of the things ways in which the remote work can can really be um, beneficial. Great. Over yeah, over to Rupa. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna actually just touch on. Like, you know, as Chai, you've mentioned, like just kind of diversifying your experiences, a lot of things that like in person doesn't offer you. Like for me, um, remote ex remote work has allowed me to get an international experience. So like last term, for example, I worked for a company called Smart Doctor and it was a Peru based company and they connect based, they connect patients and doctors through, through a telehealth platform. So, um, you know, it was solely because of remote work that I was able to work for such an awesome company and get opportunities like this. So basically through this experience, I got to really understand how like cultural barriers are not really barriers in some ways um, in a remote world because, you know, we're now unified through this like vision and like through the work that we do. And so that was really amazing. And all, all of the really, some things are really challenging, which was like the language barriers and stuff that was, you know, that was easily kind of worked around. But um, overall, I think, um, remote work really opens us up to like international experience and just kind of connecting across borders as well, which is something that was awesome for me. Very, very cool. And I, I think it's, um, it's interesting because the research that we did with students early on in the pandemic, um, when they were, when everybody moved to working from home, one of the comments that they made was it, it's about having a positive mindset. What are they, what are they gaining or benefiting from in this environment as opposed to looking at it from a deficit and what are they, what are they missing out on? So I, I completely agree. There are definitely some, uh, some advantages that, that co-ops are, are benefiting from through, through remote work. Um, We've got a question about a startup, and Rupa, I'm wondering since you've had some experience, 
with um, smaller organizations. I wonder if you could answer it. So we're growing a startup and at this stage, we don't have a great variety in the tasks, albeit they're all meaningful. Um, in the case where students' interests don't really align with the meaning, do you have strategy suggestions for keeping them happy and engaged for the remaining term? Yeah, so um, for sure, first thing I would say is, you know, I have kind of faced that where a lot of, especially during my first work term, where it was a lot of like, I remember a lot of like coding and software experience where I was wanting to look into like more business experience. Um, and I think what really drives home like the point of having meaningful and positive experiences in the workplace here is just having a chat and talking to your like co-op student about what their long-term goals are and trying to show them how maybe some of the work that they're doing can kind of fit in and align with some of their long-term goals. So sometimes it's Honestly, I think it's about painting that picture for them when it's, when it's not quite clear or when um, when the student themselves don't, sometimes the student, them, the student themselves is not able to form those connections. And I think that's when that really helps is helping form those connections. Um, but also I think maybe just even having a chat and asking the student what they want to gain from, from their experience and what projects they would like to see, um, which is something that I've kind of um, had conversations with that before, and um, my I've seen my recruiters kind of pivot that way as well. Yeah, that that's great. I think I think there's there's an important message there about the importance of the the students in in helping find that connection as well. But you're absolutely right. I think sometimes it does take someone to help connect the dots. Sometimes if if the student isn't seeing how it might relate to their experiences. So again, those informal conversations are really valuable. Um. Chai, I have two questions for you. So one is how large is Loblaw's co-op internship program and, and how many students do they have in a given work term? And then I wonder if you could also, um, given your role within Loblaw, give advice on how an organization can signal that they support innovation. Yeah, I think um, I'll maybe flip it a little bit, sure. um, the, the answer to that. And I think the the, the key thing with, with signaling innovation is honestly, be honest, right? If if you are innovative and if you do have a culture of innovation and there's some litmus tests that you can apply for yourself, there's a lot of toolkits available out there and, and we can um, send some re reference material as well. Uh, but, but it's understanding whether you're in a forming stage of, of sort of innovation and is it sort of, you know, you're, you're wanting and there's a desire, but, but there isn't really the mechanisms in place uh, for innovation. Um, or an innovative mindset, then 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 be honest, be true to who, who you are, and signal who you are. Right? Don't try to uh, you know market your way into uh, you know seeming innovative. Uh, I think is key. Uh, but but once you are, I think one of the key things is making sure that you understand what channels of engagement are out there. Uh, you know, our HR team does a very, very good job of making sure that, you know, we have messages uh, that, you know, are purposefully targeted towards our Instagram audience versus our LinkedIn audience versus, you know, the ways in which we put it out to our corporate uh, website, things like that. And so there's a strategy that, that you need to form around how you do that um, and, and, and the channel that you're going to use to really make your, your, your media um, align with, with your overall strategy. But I think the key thing is if students have a great experience and understand that innovation uh, you know is something at the heart of your organization then the word will spread yes naturally, you know yep. and we've had that with a couple of programs where we've hired students and a few students within a program and the word has really spread within that team so yeah. the moment we put out a, a co-op um, or internship for our team for the innovation team especially and overall love law technology as well and blah blah we get hundreds if not thousands of applications right off the bat 